It's May 22nd, 1863. Across the horizon is Confederate forces dug deep in at Vicksburg, and U.S. Grant is standing here with his dear friend Kump, William Tecumseh Sherman, realizing for the second time within three days they have been badly repulsed by the Confederate Army. Grant knows he cannot take this terrain. He can't take the Confederate forces. It would be a slaughter if he tries again. So he decides to do something he didn't want to do. He looks to his friend Kump and says, we're gonna lay siege. I am here at Vicksburg National Military Park and I am excited to bring you the third of my series uh, following U.S. Grant's Western Campaign as he went from Fort Henry and Donaldson to Shiloh, here to Vicksburg and eventually on over to Chattanooga. But before we go any further, remember to definitely subscribe and hit that notification button so you are aware of any time I upload any of these Civil War stories or if you're interested in any of my other stuff I teach for class such as film study or recent U.S. history. Now, Grant knows that he has to win Vicksburg. If he's going to win the war, Vicksburg has to be one to control the Mississippi River. But before we get into this victory, we need to rewind a little bit and find how did he get here. So, let's rewind a little bit. After Grant's victory at Shiloh, those that were jealous of a general continued to create controversy by sharing the bloodbath of the battle was due to Grant being a drunkard. Newspapers across the nation and politicians in D.C. continued to claim a Drunk Grant was responsible for the Union's high casualties. Yet those that fought with him will defend Grant, and a general will write his wife Julia that he was, quote, as sober as a deacon, close quote. However, and although no other general in the Union Army was having success like Grant, his victories were not enough. As a response to the heavy loss of life at Shiloh, Grant was, in essence, put on the shelf for the summer at 62. Sometimes, when you do everything right and to the best of your ability, petty rumors and ill will still went out. In days like those, one has to find a deep resilience in all of the anxiety. And this is a strength for Grant, to take the unfair punches of life and roll with them. I wonder if you could do that. After a summer of sitting in timeout, Grant is finally put back in action in the fall of 62. However, he finds his return to a time when Union leadership is struggling. George McClellan, who had failed with his Peninsula campaign, and although he had a victory at Antietam, failed to follow up on the win. Then there was Don Carlos Buell, who also won at the battlefield in Kentucky at Perryville, but once again, failed to follow through. These two failures allowed Confederates to regroup and rebuild. Meanwhile, the midterm elections turned out to have been a huge defeat for the Republicans. It seemed that the writing on the wall is that President Lincoln will be a very unpopular one-term president. Grant knows he must get something good going for the Union. Logically, in the Western campaign, this means to make plans to capture the Gibraltar of the Mississippi, Vicksburg. Vicksburg was the Confederacy's last stronghold on the river. The city was vital to the Southern economy, allowing commerce and troops to cross the Mississippi River. Capturing Vicksburg would split the Confederacy in half and give the Union control of the mighty Mississippi. But again, 
Vicksburg was the Gibraltar, and this would not be an easy task for Grant. Grant's first attempt at the well-fortified citadel was in the winter of 62, when he ordered his BFF, Sherman, to attack just north of a city. It was badly repulsed. A very frustrated Grant then had the idea of bypassing Vicksburg in the early months of 63 and trying to build a canal which would avoid the Confederate fortifications altogether on the Mississippi River. But as the spring rains came, that plan was literally washed away. To win Vicksburg, Grant had to come up with an innovative and fast-moving attack, but it would require him to develop a partnership once more with the Navy. To do this, the often mud-covered, disheveled General Grant sought out the very formal, tidy, and proper Navy commander David Dixon Porter to come in with the assist. Late in the evening on April 16th, 1863, while Confederate officers were at a ball in Vicksburg, may I have this dance, my lady? Navy Commander David Dixon Porter bravely led Union gunboats down the Mississippi River. Porter's own ship led the way on the moonless dark night, and to make things more treacherous, he ordered to have no lights visible to keep them as cloaked in a darkness as possible. The Navy was truly selling blind. Yet, one cannot simply hide a huge ironclad going downstream in a river by a city, and the Union gunships, as they approached the Confederate, lookouts sounded the alarm. Immediately, cannons high on the bluffs began to open fire, and fires were lit along the shore to provide a bright light shining across the river. The Navy was coming into a very vulnerable position, and Porter immediately ordered his ships to hug the coastline as close to Vicksburg as possible. He was gambling that the Confederate cannons, which were high above the city on cliffs, would not be able to angle their cannons low enough to fire upon his caravan. But imagine hearing those orders. Zoinks, Scooby. Like, did he say get closer to the cannons? Porter guides his own vessel within 20 yards of the banks of Vicksburg. Confederate soldiers along the shoreline could easily have played a game of catch with the Union Navy if this was not a time of war. Instead, those soldiers will be firing their rifles point-blank range into the ironclads. But rifles don't have much of an impact against ironclads. Porter was right in guessing the destructive Confederate cannons could not fire down on them and the gamble paid off. All of the Union gunboats except one, made a run past Vicksburg successfully. This brave run in the dark by Porter and the Navy will give Grant the naval guns downriver, where he will need protection across the Mississippi River with his troops. From the end of April to the middle of May, Grant made a series of moves causing confusion for the Confederate commander, John C. Pemberton. Moving from the river, Grant went to work, winning two quick battles at Port Gibson and then Raymond. The local women at Raymond had made a lavish picnic of fried chicken, anticipating a victorious rebel army would be hungry. They were shocked, surprised, and heartbroken when boys in Union Blue sat at the feast victorious. Grant continued his fast-moving attacks, heading to the Mississippi capital, Jackson. Rushing to defend Jackson was Confederate General Joseph Eggleston Johnson, who was in charge of all Western operations for the Confederacy. But as Joseph E. Johnston got there with just 6,000 men, Grant's much larger army was arriving at the same time. Old Aggie wired Jefferson Davis, I'm too late, and then fled, letting Grant have Jackson without much of a fight. Sherman will there introduce his neckties, which was destroying Confederate rail lines by heating up the railroad lines and bending them across trees. 
Pemberton, who had left the safety of Vicksburg, was heading to Jackson to support Johnston. Now he discovers he was being left high and dry due to Johnston running away from the fight. As Grant makes the turn for Vicksburg, Pemberton finds himself now in a field of battle on Saturday, May 16th at Champions Hill, and again on Sunday, May 17th at Big Black River, both just outside Vicksburg. Pemberton has set up defensive stands for Grant to attack, but the Union troops quickly overrun the Confederate lines both times. By the time church services were done on the 17th, Vicksburg parishioners were disheartened to see dejected and defeated Confederate army already returning back to Vicksburg after losing on back-to-back -back days. I'm here in the gorgeous, beautiful Illinois Memorial here at Vicksburg, and one of the things that Illinois did is they put the names of every single one of their sons uh, that were here engaged in combat on these panels, all 30 plus thousand of them. But I do want to point out one name, which is not an Illinois name. Uh, this one right here, Fred Grant. And yes, that is the 13-year-old son of General U.S. Grant. Uh, he's the oldest son, and Fred sort of stowed away when Grant went on his Western campaign. And once his dad was off on the battle and realized, oh my gosh, I have my 13-year-old son here with me, it was, it was a little too late, and he just kept his son with him. Now, Fred had a horrendous habit of going towards the front lines. He'd be excited about seeing the combat. And as his father was moving closer to Vicksburg, there was an engagement in a big black river. And Fred is right there at the front once more. And as usual, he's on top of a horse. Now, the Union has clearly won, and the Confederates are in actual retreat and a Confederate soldier sees a young officer on top of a horse a few yards away, so like any Confederate soldier would do, fired his rifle at the officer. And with that, 13-year-old Fred Grant was like, oh, I've been killed. One of U.S. Grant's aides looked at Fred and said, Fred, wiggle your toes. That's when the 13-year-old realized he wasn't dead. Fortunately for him, the wound did not require him to have his leg amputated, and it does cause him to back off a little bit from being at the front, but he is not done with military. Matter of fact, as he continues to grow up, he will also become a two-star general. So, Fred Grant. I'm going to go out on a limb and take a guess that Grant is probably happy that they did not have FaceTime back then. Hello, my dearest Julia. How are you? How I have missed you. Oh, right, Miss you. How are you? How's Fred? It's so good to see you. You know, I just want you to know that I think you really look really pretty right now. Just absolutely pretty. Well, you, you know how he, he loves the action. I mean, the boy just rides up to the front all the time. Yes. Anyways, funny thing happened. We were in a battle, and uh, the boy rode up to the front like usual, and he was, uh, he was, uh, he was shot. Wait, wait, yes, what? It, it, it's okay, dearest. Dearest, it's it's okay. It's it's just a small wound to the leg, and um. You let our son get shot. On May nineteenth and twenty second in eighteen sixty three, Grant is going to make two attacks on the Confederate lines here at Vicksburg. Now the front is almost an eight mile long front. But all the terrain is very much like what you see right here behind me. These rolling hills. And right where that monument is over in the horizon, that is Confederate defenses. This is where McPherson's at, one of Grant's three divisional commanders. And he has to 
get his troops to go up and down these little ravines uh, up to the top to where that monument is and attack the Confederate strongholds there. Um, what you don't see is what it would have looked like in 1863. One, all of these trees, they would have been cleared out. There would not have been any trees. But those trees would have been used, laid down all at the bottom uh, of the base of those hills over there just to create like a Confederate barbed wire, a Civil War barbed wire, you might say, with the, fin uh, with the trees being fell on the ground. So this is nearly a suicide kind of mission because the Confederates don't have to move and the Union has to go up and down this little bit of slopes. It's, it's not going to work. And, and Grant realizes it. Not the first time around. He thinks, I, I didn't have all my troops. But the second time, he's like, I can't do this. Grant had miscalculated that winning five battles in three weeks, including whipping up on Pemberton on back-to-back -back days, as well as capturing a state's capital, that the rebel spirit would have been broken. However, the Confederates had returned to their heavily near impossible to overtake fortifications at Vicksburg, and this had energized Southern spirits. The assault on the 19th was quickly turned back with Grant taking severe losses and the Confederates near nothing. The second attack on the 22nd, Grant's three commanders assault the eight mile front surrounding Vicksburg once again. Sherman at the north, McPherson in the center, and McLernand in the southern part of the front. Grant with his dear friend Sherman sees the assault being stalled and again he is suffering severe casualties while not really inflicting much on the Confederacy. This brings us back up to where we started the story off with Grant sharing to his friend Kump that they would instead lay siege on Vicksburg. Pemberton and his Confederate army had plenty of ammunition but they didn't have much food. To make matters worse for the Confederates, Grant orders seven horses killed and placed in the city's water sources, thus poisoning the water. Anyone who drinks that water, if it did not kill them, oh, they wish it had. With Grant and Porter cutting Vicksburg off from the outside world, Pemberton having no access to food and water, it simply would be a matter of time before he had a fold. Siege work means digging, and three days after the second failed assault on May 25th, Grant's troops began to dig trenches all around the Confederate fortifications. Grant quickly becomes a fan of the shovel, and eventually will use the spade later when he is dealing with Lee around Richmond near the end of the war. By most accounts, the siege is good for the Union Army, as they were in decent spirits with access to food and water. Grant would even often walk to the front trenches to check in on his men and see how they were doing. To keep him out of the eye of Confederate sharpshooters, he would always be in a uniform of a private. Needless to say, not only did Grant fool an eagle-eyed Confederate, but at times his own men would wonder who this private was that walked through the trenches with such confidence and care. Speaking of privates, fighting for the 95th Illinois was a private named Albert Cashby, Cashier. who we need to take a quick note of. I'm here at the 95th Illinois uh, Monument where they stood ground and one of the privates in the 95th was Albert and Albert was evidently a five foot, barely, uh, 95 pound fighter from heck. I mean, evidently could fight and was tough and rougher than anybody on the division. Uh, and coming in at five foot, 95 pounds, that was impressive. Turned out though, like years later, in the early 1900s, poor Albert was run over by one of the first cars. And when a doctor was looking at Albert, said and replied, um, sir, you're, you're, you're not a man, you're a woman. And Albert was like, shh, don't tell anyone, they'll take my pension. Turned out Albert disguised herself as a woman early in the war um, and joined, enlisted as a man because all she had to do to pass the recruitment was if you had two teeth and a trigger finger uh, and she had both that, that was the extent of the physical uh, 
and she's not alone. There will be other women that will disguise themselves as men and fight along uh, the lines here. Grant had 220 cannons lined up all around Vicksburg. Plus, he had an, an additional 100 naval guns from Porter's fleet in the Mississippi. Each day, a barrage of artillery shells would fire upon the Confederate positions, but Grant made sure the city itself was not in harm's way. That said, the civilians still dug in caves all around the hilly city and would stay in their cave day and night. For the civilians, who were also cut off from food and water and being forced to live in man-made holes in the ground, the experience was miserable. Yet through all of the artillery power fired upon Vicksburg, less than a dozen citizens will be killed by the siege. Pemberton was becoming desperate by mid-June, sending messages of the need for reinforcements which were coming back unanswered from Richmond. However, there was an attempt to cut Grant's supply line about 30 miles northwest at Milliken's Bend in Louisiana. The Union Army supplies were being guarded by two gunboats and five regiments. One of the regiments was the all-white 23rd Iowa, while the other four regiments were the 9th, 11th, 13th Louisiana, and 1st Mississippi. These four regiments had just been commissioned and comprised of recently liberated slaves. They were also some of the nation's first regiments of the United States Colored Troops, USCT. The most famous regiment of USCT will be the 54th Mass, which is depicted in the Oscar-winning and inspirational movie, Glory. But back here at Milliken's Bend, it's June 7th, and the Confederates believe if they can cut Grant's supplies here, he will be forced to pull back from Vicksburg. Although most Union white officers at the time had no confidence in black soldiers, especially those that were former slaves. When the Confederates attacked, it was the all-white Iowa Regiment that broke first and retreated, whereas the four regiments of United States Colored Troops held their ground as long as they could in a deadly hand-to-hand -hand combat. The majority of these former slaves had only a month of training, no more than a couple months at most. Additionally, they had been provided some of the Army's least quality guns, Yet, here they will fight with a determination and ferocious tenacity. Although they will be eventually overwhelmed by superior Confederate numbers, the former slaves will be forced to fall back. But their resilience allowed for support and firepower of the two Union gunboats to come into action, causing the Confederates to retreat. The casualties of the four United States Colored Troop regiments are high. The 9th Louisiana will suffer nearly 70%, and black soldiers that were captured were either returned to slavery or, after surrendering and unarmed, were executed by their Confederate captors. Grant will get a report of the bravery of the troops and proudly boast of how good of soldiers they will be with just simply proper training, and Grant will become a strong supporter of United States colored troops. A month later, the 54th Massachusetts will storm Fort Wagner. And again, I invite you to watch the movie Glory. Shortly after that event, Secretary of War Stanton will tell President Lincoln, quote, Many persons believed or pretended to believe and confidently asserted that freed slaves would not make good soldiers, that they would lack courage and that they could not be subjected to military discipline. Facts have shown how groundless these apprehensions were. The slave has proved his manhood, as well as his capacity as an infantry soldier. He has done this at Milliken's Bend, Port Hudson, and the storming of Fort Wagner. Close quote. By the end of the war, over 200,000 black soldiers many of which were former slaves, will have fought to preserve the Union by joining the United States Colored Troops. By July 1st, 
General Pemberton knows he cannot withstand a siege any longer. His troops have no water nor food. And horses and mules are disappearing from the Confederate fortifications, not because of a daily Union artillery fire, but desperate times of hunger create desperate measures. By July 3rd, Pemberton sends word to Grant that he will seek terms of peace. It's July 4th, 1863, and after 47 days of laying siege, U.S. Grant gets Pemberton to agree to surrender here at this spot. Grant does once more unconditional surrender, but what's different this time for the general is that he says he will parole all of those officers as well as soldiers upon their surrender. In other words, if a soldier turns in his guns, signs a pledge that he will not take arms again against the United States, he's free to go. He's been paroled. Officers have the same offer, except that they're allowed to keep their sidearms and a horse. Pemberton agrees, and Grant has now captured his second entire army and gives one day after the Battle of Gettysburg, Lincoln his second major victory this time capturing Vicksburg and thus controlling the entire Mississippi River. For the second time, and this time on the 4th of July, Grant has won an engagement forcing Confederates to an unconditional surrender. Dang, Yules. Clearly, the nickname fits. The casualties for the Union will be just under 5,000, but considering the results, it is a clear victory. Grant and his generals have split the Confederacy in half, seized control of the entire Mississippi River, and created an overwhelming imbalance in casualties. The Confederate casualties are a staggering 33,000, but this includes 29,000 prisoners. Additionally, Pemberton surrenders 172 cannons and 50,000 rifles. Although Grant is victorious, there is a lot of carnage on the battlefield, and one of Grant's officers will take to heart the tragic deaths of so many. The reason why I'm pointing out this monument of Major General John A. Logan, also known as Blackjack, is not because of his heroic valor that he does throughout the Civil War, but the fact is after the Civil War, being moved by all the sacrifices that were made, he's the person primarily responsible for us having Memorial Day. In a magnifying glass look back, a lot can be seen by the difference of the two opposing commanders at Vicksburg. Pemberton was often second-guessing himself, more worried about failing rather than thinking of succeeding, and he rarely listened to nor included his supporting officers in making decisions. Whereas Grant's strength was being inclusive of his officers and their counsel, he also had foresight, was diligent in planning, and had a willingness to adapt when his first plans did not succeed. Although we are still going to cover U.S. Grant, this closes our chapter on John Pemberton, and I just want to give him a quick reflection. Pemberton was unlike most Confederates as he was a Northerner, born and raised in Philly, but he chose to follow his wife's home state of Virginia when the war broke out. Northern family and friends will view Pemberton as a traitor and he will not receive much of a welcome back post-war, especially after he does not have any sorrow for his actions. However, his southern contemporaries will view him as an incompetent fool for losing Vicksburg. And maybe he was incompetent in military strategy. When he was a student at West Point, his grades for military tactics, artillery, Engine engineering were 46, 52, and 55. Yeah, those are pretty low marks. In Pemberton's final decades, he was viewed by both sides of the conflict as a villain. But in his defense, I think we at least need to ask if he was at fault for losing Vicksburg. Had Joseph E. Johnston joined Pemberton, they would have had a larger force than Grant, but Aggie flew the coop, leaving Pemberton high and dry. 
and Pemberton will never forgive Johnston for abandoning him. How could he forgive him for that? Could you have? When John C. Pemberton dies in 1881, his family will choose to bury him at their family plot in Philly. And this will generate a loud group of influential protesters not wanting them there. How do you let someone who is not willing to repent into the cemetery? One last thing about J.C. John C. Pemberton is not the developer of Coca-Cola, as some people will answer wrongly in trivia games. No, 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 no. That is Confederate officer John S. Pemberton, who is the developer of the drink. But that's a fascinating story to be told another time. All right, guys, I am here at Vicksburg National Military Park, and I have just taken a wonderful tour, absolutely wonderful, highly recommend it, with Louis Logue. Uh, and so, guys, I'm going to go to Louis' expertise here and ask him some questions that he'll be able to share these answers with you on Vicksburg. Well, the terrain was the number one reason. And the terrain has been formed over the thousands of years by the ice age out west. That thick ice crushed all the little calcium carbonate particles, made dust out of it. And for thousands of years, the wind we get from the west here, it picks up that little, those little particles. When it gets across the Mississippi River, it drops out right here. Now, this, this, we call this lowest dirt because it's a wind-blown dirt. And this lowest dirt is only about a mile wide but it can stand anywhere from 100 feet to 300 feet straight up. You can't climb it with your bare hands. And it runs from Memphis all the way down to Natchez, Mississippi. Now, and there's a little bit of it in Wisconsin. But you can imagine a whole army trying to come up to a 200 foot straight up hill like dust, carrying a 50 pound pack and a nine pound rifle and try to climb up a, a powdery uh, dirt hill. After, tr after trying that twice and Grant seeing that he could not do it, he didn't want to lose any more troops, he said, no more of this, we're going to just do what I didn't want to do, and let's put a siege on Vicksburg and starve them out. Well, he had to do three things. He had to cut off the food, water, and communication. You can cut off the communication by clipping the line, cut off the food by surrounding the area and not letting any food come in, but the Mississippi River's out front. How could he cut off the water? Well, they wasn't drinking that muddy water anyway. They were drinking water in a, a creek that was a spring-fed creek, good, clean water, one four miles south of Vicksburg and one about a mile north of Vicksburg. And he said, Grant said, well, I can handle that. Just kill seven horses, put those dead carcasses in the creek, and anybody that drinks any water down below there will get dysentery and either die or feel like they did and they couldn't fight. So that way he can cut off the food, water, and communication. Well, it, it was not the most important part because uh, it's when Pemberton went and on July the 1st and told Grant, I want to surrender. And it just happened to be that it was going to be on July the 4th the next day. Well, Grant did write in his memoirs, it's a, you know, the nation deserves a July the 4th victory here. This will be written up in all the newspapers. So it was almost an a afterthought, but then it was a real important idea because July the 4th was the birthplace of the nation. It was the, the, the whole nation's uh, conquering or, or being free. And now here's the nation again, fighting each other, being free again on the July the 4th. United we stand, divided we fall. That's our Commonwealth's motto. And here I am at Kentucky's Memorial and Monument. Uh, and actually, as you can notice, it will have both Union and Confederate divisions here at the battle. Truly, Kentucky is one of those states that is a brother versus brother state. Does John C. Pemberton deserve all the responsibilities for the loss at Vicksburg, or should Joseph E. Johnston share some of it? 
What are your thoughts about Milliken's Bend and the heroic efforts of the United States colored troops that fought there with bravery and courage? Or maybe you have another thought about Grant and his amazing ability to win after win after win. Whatever it is, leave a comment below and make sure you subscribe and hit that notification button. All right, we have one more, one more chapter to do in this series. We are going to head east to Chattanooga, uh, where Grant finishes his uh, western campaign to get the Confederates lodged off the mountains surrounding um, the city of Chattanooga. As always, guys, remain awesome, be nice, stay safe, and I will see you soon.